So this is um, based on a talk that I gave at the uh, World Society of Pediatric Infectious Diseases in Durban late last year. Um, there didn't seem to be too many uh, of the Joburg pediatricians there. Um, so I hope this isn't an old uh, news to them or anyone else. Um, so it's a perspective from a pediatric point of view, but not um, entirely confined to pediatrics. Uh, because that's, um, that wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't really be possible. So just talking about um, the biology of free living amoebae. So as I'm sure everyone knows, these are ubiquitous. Wherever you look, you will find them, including in uh, domestic settings, um, outdoor settings, uh, hospital, uh, healthcare settings as well. And there are very many uh, species of free living amoebae, but really only a restricted number are of medical importance. But those that do cause infection can often cause devastating and uh, even fatal disease. Now, um, they, these infections occur both in immunocompetent and immunodeficient uh, individuals and a variety of uh, organ systems are involved. We'll go into a bit more detail as we go along. Now, one uh, interesting aspect of the free living amoeba is that they are phagocytes, and they feed on other microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, algae, but they also host them in their, uh, in their interior. And um, some of these organisms are able to uh, adapt and survive within amoebae. And some uh, well-known examples are Legionella, Rhipoderia, which is a cause of meliodosis, and Pseudomonas mycobacteria, various other uh, bacterial species, and some interesting viruses, uh, giant viruses like Mimivirus, which incidentally I can cause um, human disease. Um, now, uh, there are two aspects which are important as far as path pathogenesis is concerned. And that is that some of these bacteria become uh, adapted and acquire uh, the ability to survive within these phagocytes, but it also seems to uh, tune them to survive inside uh, macrophages in in um, in the host, in the human host, and being inside. So that's one aspect, and then the other is that being inside these phagocytes in the form of amoebae, they shield it to some extent from the immune system, and that's where this analogy with the Trojan horse comes in. So these amoeba-resistant bacteria are able to, in a sense, hijack the amoeba to get inside the host and cause disease. So out of all the thousands of free-living amoeba species, there are really three important ones. The genuses of the genera Acanthamoeba, Bellamuthia, and Negleria. So let's start with Acanthamoeba because that's probably the most uh, well known. There are uh, a number of species, um, some of which are regarded as pathogenic, others non-pathogenic, but um, a more useful classification is via the genotype. So there are um, nearly 20 genotypes, I think, um, uh, which are I'll give a number. So T4 is the most common pathogen, T1, T10, and 
T17, I think, are also regarded as pathogenic. And these uh, pathogenic types are most commonly uh, associated with keratitis. So those are corneal infections. But they can also affect um, skin and um, respiratory tract. Um, in some cases, they may just colonize uh, the respiratory, respiratory tract. In fact, a good proportion of people at any one time will will harbor acanth amoebas in their uh, in their pharynx, nasopharynx. This is a site of um, of spread in some cases, and then most uh, concerningly, um, they can infect the central nervous system. Moving on to Bellamuthia, so there's one pathogenic species, uh, Bellamuthia mandrillaris. For a long time, that was thought to be the only species, but another one's been found in deep water sediments. Just, that's just incidental, it's got nothing to do with human disease. And these organisms um, also infect the skin and a respiratory tract, and again, can spread to the central nervous system. Now, both acanthamoeba and Bellamuthia only have trophozoite and cyst forms, which are shown in these pairs of pictures. The third important species, Nagleria, Nagleria fowleri is the only pathogenic species, and they is responsible for a disease called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Now, this species has both trophozoites in the middle, and cysts, and importantly, free living or free swimming flagellated form, which is um, present in swims around in water, and that provides a means of acquiring the infection. Then there are some other uh, species which are generally uh, saprophytic, non-pathogens, but occasionally have been found in human disease. Uh, Worm amoeba um, has been found in, I think in just one or two cases, uh, appear to be responsible for keratitis. Palavalcanthia, uh, is a, um, there's been one case of this infection mimicking primary amoebic meningitis, but a much milder disease than usual. And then Sapinia is always mentioned, but there's only ever been one case of central nervous system infection uh, due to Sapinia. So we can largely forget about those, uh, those species and just concentrate on the three main pathogenic species. So starting with uh, keratitis, so um, as I mentioned, we're looking at this from a pediatric point of view. If you look at all the causes of, of non-viral keratitis, the risk factors for keratitis are mostly trauma, uh, particularly in developing countries. In developed countries, it's primarily contact lens wear that is the main risk factor. And where children are involved, it's, I guess, mainly therapeutic rather than uh, cosmetic. And of course, children may not look after their lenses properly. That's something we'll come back to later. The previous ocular infections, uh, conditions, various systemic diseases, things which compromise epithelial surfaces or risk factors for keratitis. In terms of the pathogens causing keratitis, uh, gram positives and fungi are common in developing countries and particularly the tropics associated with trauma, where contact lens wear in children is more frequent than Pseudomonas aeruginosa and acanthamoeba species 
are more more important. Again, as I mentioned, associated with contact lens work. Well. Some reviews which have looked at the proportion of keratitis cases caused by acanthamoeba. That's a low percentage in India and Taiwan, two to seven percent. High in USA, up to twenty five percent in Canada. And these were all in contact lens wearing children. Of our acanthamoeba keratitis cases that, that we've um, identified, diagnosed over the years, only one has been in a child that was a three year old who, in fact, was a contact lens wearer. So the, the pathogenesis of keratitis uh, generally involves some lesion, some injury, often very minor, to the, to the cornea. And this can be due to um, improper contact ends where leaving them in too long and not cleaning them. That provides a foothold for the amoebae to attach to these um, it's got mannose receptors which bind to exposed tissue. The amoebae secrete uh, enzymes, virulence factor, which allow them to penetrate through the uh, epithelium, through Bowman's membrane, and into the uh, stroma of the cornea, uh, where they again will disrupt the architecture. They invade. Uh, this perineuronal involvement, invasion, which is partly responsible for the severe pain that these uh, patients almost invariably have. And the infection generally remains confined to the cornea, it doesn't penetrate beyond the, um, beyond this level of the eye. So this is a patient with at the top right, acanthamoeba keratitis, and you can see the uh, the central uh, lesion in the uh, in the cornea, the ragged edges stained with fluorescein where that's the yellow, and this ring-shaped infiltrate as they may be spread in the stroma of the cornea, and uh, this can be uh, difficult to treat if it's not recognised uh, early enough. Unfortunately, many of these patients put on steroids as soon as they develop a painful eye. And this accelerates the, the, the disease. And ultimately, uh, corneal transplant may be necessary if, if topical treatment is not successful. And just, uh, this is an aside, but I just couldn't resist uh, putting this in. There's been um, a speculation that um, Hannibal, who crossed the Alps, if you remember, on, on elephants to his army, uh, to take his army into Italy, um, uh, developed a very painful um, eye condition, which eventually led to the loss of the eye. And this, this is speculating that it may have been acanthamoeba infection, or no, no particular solid evidence, but they do um, mention uh, elephant-associated zoonoses as a group, and um, uh, these include leptospirosis and mycobacterial infections and brucellosis, all of which can affect the eye. So getting back to the topic, um, acanthamoeba in our reference lab at NICD was reviewed by Charlotte and colleagues uh, at FITSA last year, the year before actually. Um, yes, the year before. Um, so over this, this time period, 
uh, more than um, 25 years, uh, we've um, received 164 specimens and uh, for investigation, of which 15% were positive for the cantonese via various methods, which were mentioned. Uh, um, the three-year-old I mentioned, most patients are, are adults, the median is 36 years. Um, majority of female is female, and um, uh, nearly half of the, these patients will contact lenses. And I mentioned the importance of T4 as the, as the main pathogen gene. Now, um, Danasha presented this case of disseminated acantamoeba infection um, on this in the series. It must be a couple of years ago now. So this is just to remind you that um, this was an HIV positive man um, who'd had uh, some previous admissions, but on this occasion came in with a headache, malaise, and um, eye problems, and his main issue was these discrete, um, painful subcutaneous, subcutaneous nodules that he had had for a couple of months, some of which were, were ulcerating. So a biopsy was done, uh, and maybe were visualized on histopathology and um, proven to be acantamoeba on on our investigations using culture and PCR and sequencing. So he uh, did respond quite well to a whole mixture of anti uh, antibiotics and antifungals. We'll mention the treatment later. And there was some improvement, but uh, unfortunately he acquired a, a possible infection and, and demise. Dinesha did write to suffer for tropical medicine and infectious diseases in 2022. Now, the, the main focus um, of our attention is uh, central nervous system uh, infections. And um, we're looking at primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, or PAM. As mentioned, Megalaria fowleri is the organism there. Then granulomatous amoebic encephalitis, or GAE, they're both acantamoeba and balamuthia, which this condition. And uh, I mentioned that sapinia is always included, although there's only ever been one case of this infection. So the route of acquisition for PAM is different from GAE. The Negleria fowleri, as I mentioned, has this flagellated form, which is free swimming in the water, and that is the uh, source of infection. When water gets up to the nose during swimming uh, and diving, and um, also uh, nasal irrigation for, for various reasons, religious or, or health, through and then uh, through the uh, olfactory epithelium gets directly into the central nervous system. For um, a cantamoeba, uh, either cysts or trophozoites are able to infect skin, which may be the, the primary site, or probably more commonly uh, the upper respiratory tract. In some cases, may spread contiguously into the central nervous system from there, or via the lungs and the bloodstream into the nerve, central nervous system. And similarly for Bellamuthia mandrillaris.
So I know this slide's got probably too much information, but it's useful to compare these two major central nervous system uh, infections. I've highlighted or put in red text the, the key information here. So PAM, generally it's immunocompetent individuals, mainly children, adolescents, young adults, in contrast to GAE, where we're largely looking at um, immunodeficient individuals, particularly for acanthamoeba, and not necessarily for balamuthia, this, but that can affect both immunocompetent and immunodeficient. And here, these patients are mainly adults. For PAM, it's contact with warm water containing these, uh, the organism. So it's swimming and diving basically in warm water. And these are often natural uh, rivers, dams and streams, but also engineered um, venues like a white water or surfing um, facilities or uh, splash pads. Um, also, a borehole or rainwater harvest, harvested stores can all become infected and be a source of the infection. And then I mentioned nasal rinsing uh, for health or, or religious purposes using contaminated water. The predisposition on the GAE side, it's various forms of immunodeficiency. Um, and then winter, and especially soil exposure in the Americas for Balamuthia. And in that part of the world, it seems that Spanish ethnicity is a risk factor for using the genetic, it's a genetic predisposition there. For PAM, people of entry is olfactory neuroepithelium skin respiratory tract for GAE. So PAM is basically an acute meningoencephalitis with all the features of a bacterial meningoencephalitis. And that's often the, uh, the initial diagnosis. And um, it's really a fulminating uh, meningoencephalitis. And most patients affect die within a couple of days. GAE, on the other hand, is much more chronic, subacute, uh, incubation up to months. Um, Balamuthia infections tend to be a bit more uh, acute, as short as a day, but generally um, towards a month, often preceding skin lesions, particularly central face lesions. Um, Signs of uh, an evolving uh, encephalitis with behavioral uh, changes, change in personality. Survival time there is um, well, under, six, under six weeks. For PAM, LP findings are generally a neutrophilic reaction, although it's somewhat variable. And importantly, if you look at the CSF on a wet prep, you may be able to see the amoebae, active amoebae, but it does require a microscopy of, of CSF, of a wet prep, which is not uh, what usually done. So there has to be some um, suspicion to ask the laboratory to do that. The GAE, um, LP is often contraindicated because they have a high rate of uh, increased uh, intracranial pressure and there's a danger of herniation. It tends to be a lymphocytic reaction and importantly you don't find amoebae uh, in the CSF. The amoebae are in the brain uh, brain canal cell. The PAM imaging shows edema Meningeal enhancement, 
evidence of hydrocephalus and uh, ultimately basal or rapidly developing basal ganglia infarction. GAE, you get a variety of focal parenchymal lesions, um, hemorrhagic infarctions, again, some meningeal involvement. Um, for PAM, the pathology is basically these hemorrhagic uh, areas of brain lysis. This is where the, the brain eating uh, amoebae description uh, originates, I suppose. Um, and likewise, for GAE, um, there's brain softening in these hemorrhagic areas. Uh, hemorrhagic infarct, and uh, often the brain stem involvement is the final cause of death. Treatment, um, I'll come, come back to this, but just uh, have a look here. The traditional treatment and the primary, still the primary treatment for PAM is amphotericin B. That's the vital thing amongst everything else you may add. Recently, miltefacine and now nitroxylene uh, are probably uh, going to be important if you can get them. For GAE, again, those same two uh, new newish drugs uh, appear, but I'll come back to the treatments later. With both of these, the um, prognosis is, is dismal. Uh, for PAM, more than nearly 100% mortality. Uh, in the US, I think there have been ever four or survivors of this condition, more than children. Uh, for GAE, these are the numbers, by the way, about 300 in the, in the literature, 200 Benamuthias, 150 acantamoeba GAEs, and um, maybe a slightly lower. Mortality rates will be probably improving with um, better recognition and better treatment. So um, just uh, beware the neti pot um, for rinsing out your sinuses. Certainly don't use tap water. Um, make sure you use. Uh, be some sort of disinfected or sterilized. So there's an interesting anecdote around this. In Pakistan, they noticed um, a number of cases of Negleria in uh, amoebic men and uh, meningocephalitis. And this was ascribed to um, you know, the, the Muslim ritual in a city, cities where the water supply disinfection had broken down and people were rinsing out their noses with contaminated, non-chlorinated water and a number of cases arose from that. But the, in terms of treatment, this is what uh, up-to-date says. Um, they preface this, as you'll find in all the, all the reviews of treatment, that um, the optimal approach is uncertain because experience is based on a limited number of case reports. Obviously, there's not enough cases to, uh, to compare regimens in any sort of um, systematic way. For PAM, uh, this is uh, what UpToDate says. Um, cerebral edema is controlled with um, steroids and conventional amphotericin B is given intravenously and with or without uh, intrathecal injection. So despite the um, you know, high rate of toxicity of conventional amphotericin B, it's substantially more active against Nagleria fowleri than 
you know, the less toxic uh, versions of the terrorists and the liposomal and so on. So it's amphotericin B combined with rifampicin, fluconazole, azithromycin, and this drug, miltefacine, is now regarded as um, desirable or obligatory if you can get hold of it. So miltefacine is, um, it was originally a, an anti a neoplastic drug and was found to have activity against uh, Ishmania. So in fact, now it's um, one of the drugs of choice for treating certain visceral leash, leishmaniasis. It's um, e extremely uh, expensive and really only available through, um, through government or uh, NGO donations. Um, and um, the and primarily for Ishmania, right? the, the WHO does facilitate its its um, availability via via MSF in Ishmaniasis and in in certainly in our cases I'll mention later for some cases of Malamuthia infection. Um, <clears throat> so generally, as I mentioned, these patients um, demise quite quickly. So the um, for the survivors, I guess they're talking about here the the optimal duration is uncertain. And the GAE side uh, boils down to multiple drugs for prolonged periods, and um, looking at the rather small number of surviving patients, uh, this is the um, this is the recommended drugs. A combination of pentamidine, fusitazine, fluconazole, and either clarithromycin or azithromycin, plus uh, sulfadiazine. There's miltefacine again, thioridazone, which I don't know what that is, or, or liposomal amphotericin B in this case. So it's the same for balamuthia and uh, azithromycin, except you leave out the macrolide for. Uh, sorry, for um, acanthamoeba. So the same regimen for melamuthia and acanthamoeba, but you leave out the macrolide for acanthamoeba. And um, there's, there's a suggestion that a um might be um, useful in as well. So it basically comes down to whatever you think may work, you throw at it and, and hope, hope for the best. But it seems that there are a, a it's a combination of antibacterial, anti protozoal, and antifungal drugs, which, um, which is, may or may not work. In terms of miltefacine, um, it's recommended, although the review of, I think it was 27 Balamuthia cases where it was used, um, 27, yes, 27 cases, um, about a third of the survivors had received multifacine, and about two thirds of those who died had also received multifacine. So it's really difficult to 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 say um, how effective it really is. 
But if you if you can get it, you should use it. So I mentioned my trunk sitting as well. So uh, <clears throat> this is um, something really new in the block for these infections. Uh, it's an old drug. Um, it's a hydroxyquinolone uh, with um, broad spectrum and good safety record. And it's still being used for uncomplicated UTI in many countries. And in fact, it was um, once used in South Africa. The, uh, the older clinicians may remember something called nicene. That contained, it was a combination of nitroxidine and something else. And it has uh, excellent in vitro activity against Balamuthia. And now this is, um, this is, this in vitro activity is now known to extend to Megalaria fowleri and Acanthamoeba species. And so far, there's been one successful case. Um, and there's the, the reference at the bottom if you, if you care to if you're interested to look at that. Um, and so it's currently regarded as investigational only, but it does seem to, uh, at least from the in vitro point of view, and this one case report uh, seem to have worked well. So it does have the potential for improving treatment outcomes. And um, unlike you know, some of those other drugs, it really is a, it's got a historically safe record. So, um, talking about the laboratory diagnosis now, um, so the four main modes of, of diagnosis from the lab point of view, there's microscopy, um, direct microscopy on wet preparations in the CSF, for example, where you may see a motile amoebae. Um, you may um, do a stain preparation of that type of sample, which enables you to distinguish more easily the amoebae from the, from the inflammatory cells. So there's, there's an amoeba surrounded by this polymorphs and um, some uh, monocytes there, or macrophages. Um, histopathology is um, sort of only done on tissue samples obtained after demise, but I guess not always. Uh, the amoebae themselves can be difficult to, to make out in this the section on the right, they're particularly easy to see, but the histopathologist has to distinguish them from, from macrophages or other tissue, other host tissue cells from, from, uh, from yeasts. Um, uh, has to be able to recognize cysts as well as trophozoites. It's not always easy. So uh, immunofluorescence may assist, or if you look at the bottom left here, uh, immunohistochemistry showing up the, the amoebae in this, in this very typical perivascular infiltrate. And then ultrastructurally, uh, EM uh, is another mode that may help you with identification in uh, not on not, primar not primary diagnosis, but on cultured material. That moves, takes us on to culture. So um, acanthamoebas are quite easy to culture, or relatively easy. Um, it's done on non-nutrient agar with a film or lawn of, of bacteria, usually E. coli, and the amoebae feed on the bacteria and uh, multiply. And uh, that's those are that's a stain preparation from. Uh, culture, 
Malamuthia won't grow on, or doesn't grow readily on that sort of uh, surface or preparation. Um, unlike Acanthamoeba and also Negleria, incidentally, uh, Malamuthia uh, require um, living cells to to identify or to grow in culture. And this is a cell culture showing um, these uh, Balamuthia trophozoites invading the invading the, the tissue cells here. So it's really revolutionized diagnosis is PCR, uh, conventional PCR with the, is a typical gel or real time. And more recently, of course, the uh, development of more available um, metagenomic new generation sequencing or next generation sequencing, um, where uh, one has an unbiased um, amplification of all the, uh, the, the DNA, all the DNA. Um, and since these are generally human infections, you end up with the vast majority of it being human, and the trick is to tease out the very small proportion that's not human, and of that, even smaller proportion, which is uh, your um, the genome of your organism. In, your target organism, and then um, comparison with uh, the databases of known uh, species. So in this example, this was a, a Balamuthia um, identified from using next generation sequencing. So expensive, resources demanding, but um, uh, maybe it may be available in some centers, or only available in specialist centers. Unfortunately, most of the central nervous system diagnoses are made post-mortem. And the, the typical post-mortem appearance in PAM is um, a hemorrhagic uh, um, meningoencephalitis um, with destruction of the olfactory lobes where the um, infection only originated. As you can see over here, they've been turned to, to mush. And then invasion deeper in the brain along the, the blood vessels. The TAE, it's um, generally is. Um, granulomatous uh, and necrotic uh, areas with, with brain infarction in places. Uh, I wanted to just um, amuse you with some of our uh, culture, for me be growing in culture, um, Let's see if I can get this. So this was a cornea removed. That's this, one of the stitches from this corneal implant or transplant, which was removed. And growing away from the, the lens, these are the uh, amoebae, the cantamoeba. And um, they don't look as though they're doing much, but if you keep an eye on these bright spots in them, you'll see them, look at that one, for example, you'll see them um, disappear suddenly and then reappear. So these are contractile vacuoles, which is the way the bacteria, uh, the amoebae, control the amount of fluid in their cytoplasm. So you'll see the these uh, vacuoles are coming and going as they sort of wink at you at this low, 
So acant amoebas are pretty um, sluggish things. Uh, this is a higher power view of two of them. And there you can see the contractile vacuole contracting. If you look carefully, you can just make out a nucleus here and a nucleus there. And to show you that they can move, this is a group of three. One looks as a sorry about the quality. This is taken a long time ago. We were still recording on videotape, if you some of you may have heard of that. Uh, this one looks as though it's been squeezed out, but it is moving away from the other two. So, so very uh, slow moving. Nevertheless, one can watch them for hours. Oh, okay, I've watched them for hours down the bottom. So, so um, by comparison, I want to show you um, another free living amoeba species. Now, this is Verm amoeba, which I uh, mentioned as a as probably mainly a, or almost exclusively as a um, saprophyte, a long pathogen, just the one keratitis case. But uh, by comparison with the cantamoebas, verm amoebas are the race species in the amoebic world. Uh, relatively Moving, we can see that one racing across the gap now. Now, what you can see nicely is the way they stick out the, they extend their membrane, and then the cytoplasm flows into that that space that they uh, produced. These are the the pseudopodia. So these are uncommon infections. Uh, this was a review from, um, I think, last year, which uh, summarized the, um, these were PAM cases for the last five years. And um, so about, this is um, 12 cases um, in, that have been published and about seven of them, seven or eight of them are in children or, or under 20s anyway. So uh, somewhat more than half uh, in, various, um, in various countries. But of course, this is only a subset of the total number, only the ones that have been appeared in publications. But what about PAM in, in South Africa? Well, there's only been one case published, and this was a case that occurred in a child, seven-year-old girl, who was camping with her family on the, the banks of the Fish River in um, Namibia, and they were swimming in um, the warm and sometimes stagnant water along the, along the river. Uh, she developed a headache fever, vomiting, um, signs of meningitis. The LP showed um, actually a lymphocytic uh, predominance. A wet prep was done, which showed motile amoebae. And um, which was very astute, I think, of the laboratory to look, or astute of the clinician to ask the laboratory. 
and the dismount treatment with amphotericin B and um, antifungal, myclomazole, infamicin, and dexamethasone, etc. But she demised a few hours after starting treatment. And the Gleria Fowleri was confirmed by the CDC using uh, the methods that they had at the time, including immunofluorescence. But this was published in the Journal of Infection in 1993. Now, um, if you look, you'll find these organisms. Uh, this was a study which looked at uh, rainwater tanks in West Cape in Claymont, uh, Claymont uh, estate of some sort residential estate, and 18% uh, had Nagleria fowleri. Um, it, they compared it to an Australian song, which in fact had a fewer or lower percentage. So um, it just, it's a, it's a, just emphasizes the fact that um, this Harvested rainwater may not be safe to uh, to swim or shower or spray your children in with. And Amuthia mandranoris again, last five years, um, predominantly older individuals, but not exclusively. When there's a four-year-old uh, over there. And um, really, a, a wide a range of, of presenting features, clinical features, which all all complicates the uh, recognition of this uh, disease. What about FLA in South Africa? Um, so, have there been four recognised cases? Um, how quickly? I'll go through the, the first one. That was the first. The second, 2021, this was Professor um, Tutla and James Natal, amongst others, in at Red Cross. And this one, Hafsa uh, presented on this meeting uh, a while ago. In the end, unfortunately, um, uh, fatal outcome, but the uh, diagnosis was confirmed as balanuthia. Then two cases that have turned up more recently in uh, the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital in Johannesburg, uh, one with a chronic sinus infection, a long history over a couple of years, um, then went on to develop encephalopathy and unfortunately the lives. Again, proven um, to be a uh, Balamuthia. And then another one, um, but at only at, sorry, only at post mortem. And then more recent one. You presented like a, a cold spinal cord tumor, and a biopsy revealed pre living amoebae and Bellamuthia mandrivalis was, was proven in our laboratory. So, with these two um, leftover metaphysin from the Red Cross case, was able to be administered, but in both cases, too late. Uh, we also facilitated getting nitroxylene, and it did seem to be an initial good clinical response, but uh, unfortunately the child developed intractable vomiting, probably due to brainstem involvement, and was unable to receive the drug and um, at the myers. Now the first case that we um, identified in 2017 
uh, I've presented this a number of times, and I'm sure um, people in the audience will remember it, so I'm not going to, uh, to go through it in detail, but basically the child um, uh, had been well. There was a history of a dog bite on the face, and then uh, within a few months uh, developed um, basically an encephalopathy with um, with changes on the MRI. This isn't the child's MRI, but I'm guessing it was something similar. Um, but uh, within a month, uh, the child had, had demised. And a limited uh, brain biopsy was done um, with uh, the only positive finding was an organism called Acromobacter dinotrificans, with an environmental organism of unknown significance. Um, but in the histopathology at post mortem, um, organisms that resemble free living amoebae were, were spotted on the histology. Um, and we managed to culture a free living amoeba, but unfortunately, other than knowing it wasn't a amoeba or Bellamuthia, we were unable to identify it further. These are just pictures from the culture and various preparations, which I won't post. In uh, Hafsa's case, uh, Hafsa and colleagues' case has been, has been published in the Journal of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Um, so you can look at that if you want to see the details. Um, so just in summary, to finish off with, um, these infections are uncommon and almost certainly often undiagnosed or in a small number of cases, if there's a diagnosis, it's usually delayed. High mortality for the CNS infections and keratitis can also have or well, less not fatal or it's still tragic if the eye has to be enucleated, which sometimes happens. And when to think of these infections, these are just some, some, some trigger points. Um, if a patient develops a painful keratitis and is a contact lens wearer, think of it. Acute meningoencephalitis following swimming or diving in warm water. Uh, chronic skin lesions, especially midline, central face skin lesions, um, or chronic sinusitis, particularly in immunocompromised individuals. Don't forget about the immunocompetence. From the diagnosis point of view, routine labs won't be able to, to help much other than with maybe some a pathology, but by then it's usually too late. And treatment requires combinations of drugs. Well, tefacine seems to be important, uh, and possibly nitroxylene uh, on the way. And um, certainly, if we can help with NICD in any way, don't hesitate to contact us. So, there are a lot of uh, people involved in these, in our clinical cases, um, uh, at, um, in Cape Town, the Red Cross, and um, Johannesburg, all, the, all set up. And then um, these individuals helped with hiring in nitroxidine. Aceris is the Chinese company that produces it. And it would, we, wouldn't have been able to get hold of meltefacine if it hadn't been for colleagues at WHO and, uh, and MSF. And I think that's included. Great. Thank you so much, John. Really, really interesting as usual. And and um, always a little bit alarming, you know, whenever I think of these, you know, with um, you know, some of the, say, the granulomatous amoebic encephalitis cases, which, you know, we must miss. I mean, we, they are rare infections, but equally, we so seldom get biopsies in, say, you know, in a patient with advanced HIV and some lesions in the brain. Um, 
it's it's always a little bit scary, <laughs> especially because they're quite hard to diagnose, as you've said. Um, the you mentioned it's these are obviously found locally in the in the freshwater supplies. Uh, is it does municipal sort of uh, water contain them as well, or is it just fresh water with before it's treated? Well, it, it probably does, um, because of course, on its way to you in your bathroom tap, the water's been sitting in in the reticulation for a while, and uh, that becomes that's not a sterile environment. It, it's it's uh, colonized by a variety of organisms, um, including including amoebae, um, and of course we know that the municipal water and domestic water supplies can produce uh, can be a source for Legionella infections, and the Legionella the source of the Legionella probably largely free living amoebae living in your in the water pipe. So um, yes, um, there's no uh, there's no escape from them. It's just uh, fortunate that you know, relatively or very, very few people ultimately get infected. If you consider the the fact that most people are exposed to some extent every day. Yeah, that's a great point. And I was actually going to ask about that as well. The, um, someone's got the hand up. Of, you don't have a name, unfortunately. It's A002. Um, you can go ahead. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. It's me. It's Figile, my banner. Um, hey, <laughs> hey, Jeremy. Hi, Prof. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I've actually been lucky enough to have um, heard this presentation before when uh, Prof presented it at Wispet. Um, I think it's last year, last year. And I think for me as well, I share your sentiments, Jeremy, that the first kind of feeling for me was how scarily similar some of the CSF looks to, you know, like a bacterial infection and how outside of, you know, doing a wet prep, it could just look like a, any meningitis, especially with the presentation as well. And I think for me, what it then does is it highlights the importance of that history taking, you know, that um uh, focusing in and asking that you know to to be able to get um uh, the swimming history the use of the nasal water sprays or whatever and i think you know it just really highlights that for me because yeah when you look at the csf and <laughs> the presentation it it could very well be a bacterial meningitis and i'm sure we we we, we must miss so many of these thank you again Prof. Yeah, I think point well taken. Um, we we kind of out of time, but there's just one question in the chat as well from Kim asking about how do you, if you remembered how Dinash's patient was diagnosed, did they did they see it on hist histology or how did they diagnose it? Yes, um, it was seen on histology. Uh, we also cultured it and um, and sequenced it. Okay, got it. So so there's no doubt about the. Um, there's no doubt about the the diagnosis. Um, it was just a. I mean, the, the the tragedy of that case is the patient was uh, was appeared to be doing quite well, um, and wasn't. And it seems not killed by that infection, but by some other um, horrible bug that he got in the hospital. Yeah. And is that um is that disseminated form the sort of disseminated granulomatous amoebic disease like that patient is that more common than the granulomatous amoebic encephalitis or or is it hard to say? No, I think it's I think it's actually less common, although well described. Um, and well, maybe let's say less commonly recognised. Um, skin, I think there's a there's an increase in awareness of of skin infection by these organisms. Um, so it may be, um, you know, it may be better diagnosis may be improved, may be improving. But I, um, you know, the, the central nervous system infections 
um, I think attract the attention because they're more, they're more spectacular. And of course, there's a wide, um, there's a wide uh, differential, you know, including things like toxoplasma and TB and, um, you know, all the things that can cause ring enhancing lesions uh, in the brain, fungal infections. Um, and it may well be that some of those skin infections have the same sort of wide differential. And the me being maybe forgotten. <laughs> yeah. But I, I I think it's actually I mean, in hindsight, probably, you know, I think what you said is initially is right, that it probably is a lot less common than the brain because, well, you know, we, we actually have a lot more ready access to tissue, at least. I mean, most of those lesions that they're not resolving would get biopsied in a tertiary center, but even in a tertiary center, almost none of them, or very few, let's put the central nervous system lesions would get biopsied. Yeah. I think the caveat there is that um, it can be difficult to spot the amoebae in, in tissue, no matter what the tissue is. Yeah. So you need a, an astute uh, histopathologist.